Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark. Joining me is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And thanks for sticking with us after last week's epic length episode. There was just a lot to talk about in that movie. We had lots of opinions. It was just such a diversion from (laughs) all of the movies that came before it. And today we are looking at Diamonds Are Forever, the massive overcorrection. It sure is. Whew. Yeah. (laughs) 1971, directed by Guy Hamilton, who directed Goldfinger, because they wanted to make Goldfinger again. And that's not me sort of saying that this feels like Goldfinger, because it doesn't really, but the production team wanted to make Goldfinger again by their own admission to the extent that they got Richard Maybaum back to do screenplay. He'd been doing screenplay for a while. That's not necessarily unusual. They got Guy Hamilton back to direct, who was the director of Goldfinger, and they somehow managed to get Sean Connery to return as James Bond. And by they, I mean United Artists. United Artists really wanted Sean Connery back. And by somehow, you mean by backing a dump truck full of money up to his house. $1.25 million was the budget for Sean Connery, which was absolutely unheard of in those days. Almost $8 million adjusted for inflation. And granted, sometimes these days you can have people demanding paychecks of something approaching that level that's not necessarily outside the realm of possibility in today's economy but in 1971 that was grotesque (laughs) yeah in addition like there's more to it right it's not just the money too they offered him two additional films of his own choosing in addition to that money to try and pull him back in yeah and they only ended up making one of them the offense right yes they made the offense which i have not seen but they they promised him that if he would do this movie he could also do two other movies for united artists of his and get paid for them of his choice and they only ended up doing the one but the producers search for a new james bond after george lazenby didn't return got so far along that This would be a great trivia question of how many actors have been paid to play James Bond for the Eon movie productions, because the answer is more than you think, because they had a James Bond. They had cast an American actor by the name of John Gavin, who was in Psycho and Thoroughly Modern Millie, and they felt that they needed to move in a more american direction they felt they were losing the all-important american audience and they wanted to cast an american in the role and they wanted to set a movie in america and make it all you know really appeal to americans was the intent but after pressure from united artists they'd managed to get sean connery to come back and cubby broccoli demanded that if they were going to do that they were going to pay john gavin out his salary for playing James Bond because it was so far along and they were just ripping the rug out from under this guy who thought he was going to be the next James Bond. I don't know how much he got paid. It assuredly was not as much as Sean Connery. (laughs) (laughs) No doubt. The entire budget of this movie was only 7.2 million and 1.25 of that went to Sean Connery. So the visual effects budget was significantly reduced and there were fewer sort of exotic locations. In fact, the exotic location is Las Vegas, which didn't land for American audiences as an exotic location. Yeah, it kind of wouldn't. No, because you can just go there and it's like not great. (laughs) (laughs) But they've brought back all the things that were missing in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Sean Connery female co-stars with ridiculous character names camp and boy did they yeah basically they realized or at least they assumed and in the day they probably assumed correctly that what audiences wanted out of james bond was not a serious spy movie with feelings but international super spy doing goofy stuff around the world with gadgets and women and to be fair that is what 
draws me to the series as well. <laughs> as we said at the beginning, Matt and I are coming at this entire franchise from a position of we like James Bond. Like our baseline is we like all of these to some extent with fluctuations depending on them and again ohmss surprised me in how much i did enjoy it but this particular entry does feel very by the numbers it sure does you know you called it an overcorrection i think this is the point this is probably the first point in the films where it overcorrects back into unwitting self-parody yeah i think so i'm tipping my hand <laughs> towards the end of the episode here already i don't think very fondly of this film <laughs> it is a serious overcorrection, and it shows it in all the worst ways well let's get into it then sure i want to point out that the first thing we see is sean connery in the gun barrel sequence and unlike ohmss where it was in color they use the previous footage of Connery from You Only Live Twice, so it's in black and white again. Mm. This is also the last time that Bond would wear a hat in this sequence. He hasn't worn a hat since? No. It was probably outdated in 71 anyway, and they just didn't reshoot it. Yeah, you're probably right. After the gun barrel sequence does its circle transition, we are back in Japan, sort of where Connery's Bond last left off, and I wonder if that was intentional. I guarantee you it was intentional. Given how much this movie, like... Tries to pretend that Lazenby never happened? Yeah, I think they're essentially like, oh yeah, that movie didn't happen. It's We're, we're picking up right where we left off with the Bond that you remember. Which is funny because they would categorically acknowledge OHMSS in a future Bond movie. Yeah, they do it a couple of times. Yeah, it's odd. Anyway, so yeah, Bond is in Japan and let's say questioning a Japanese man who is very badly dubbed bond who is actually whose face is unseen at this point is looking for information on the location of blofeld and the japanese man says cairo and so then we quickly transition to a casino in cairo and the unseen bond attacks a man in a fez who sends him to another location we then go to this other location where there's a girl by a pool who asks who it is who's approaching her and we get a shot of a slightly older looking Sean Connery who says it's Bond, James Bond. Not like unreasonably older, but he's definitely older than he was when we saw him in You Only Live Twice. Yeah, Bond is, uh, or rather Connery is showing his age in this movie. He doesn't show his age. Now I'm tipping my hand for like way later in the franchise. He is not showing his age to the same extent that Roger Moore would be towards the end of his tenure yeah wow but as compared to lazenby who felt younger relative to connery in you only live twice already the the flip back to like it's been almost it's been what four years for connery at this point mm -hmm. the the flip back to a now still four year older connery is quite jarring but he but he's got like a little bit of silver showing in his hair at this point he's not quite as fresh looking as he was in the earlier films that became really apparent to me in a future scene with m which i'll talk about when we get there but he again let's say violently questions this woman for her information on where blofeld is and then we cut to blofeld well kinda we cut to a series of latex busts as they move through progression of it's like a lab where they've been doing plastic surgery. We see Blofeld enter, and we only know it's Blofeld because they call him Blofeld, and he's wearing a high-collared beige suit like Blofeld would. But he looks completely different. He has a full head of hair, and also we've seen this guy before. This is actor Charles Gray, who, speaking of You Only Live Twice, played Henderson in that movie, and is definitely much better suited to be a bad guy than, than an MI6 informant. You think so? I... I well, I mean, I don't honestly think he's my favorite Blofeld. I'm just saying that he always struck me as a bad guy in You Only Live Twice, even though he never did anything to indicate it. All right, fair enough. He just seemed really sort of creepy and unsettling. Okay, yeah, I can see that. It's just such a weird left turn to now be played by someone who looks completely different. He's not bald anymore. I don't know if they're trying to say that he had plastic surgery to look like this, because that's not what happens. He's making doubles of himself to yeah. protect himself against assassination. But it is very jarring how different he is than 
Donald Pleasance or Telly Savalas. Yeah, he I, I I don't think the implication is there that he has like changed his face just by nature of the fact that Bond knows who he is essentially right. immediately and knows like recognizes him on site later. Like, I think that the the implication is just that they are, you know, making copies of his face or doing a face off situation, but without taking his face off. <laughs> yeah, as, as you say, creating lookalikes to double for him. Though we don't necessarily know that yet. But what happens is a bunch of scientists put a man into a mud bath and sort of cake his face in mud and then go, great, now we're all just going to leave the room because nothing possibly could go wrong. As they're all leaving, another doctor in full mask and scrubs and everything walks in and they don't seem to care. And we pan down and see that there's an unconscious doctor in the bushes. We cut inside and, of course, that doctor is now Bond, who takes his scrubs off and looks around this strange science cave. It is a strange science cave. (laughs) It's such an odd location for this. Like, it's a cool set, but it's very odd. It is. The man in the mud bath, who we don't know who it is, notices Bond and raises a gun out of the... He's armed in the bath. His muddy gun comes up out of the thing. (laughs) Bond notices this, dives towards the machine, flipping a lever and dumping more and more mud onto this guy's head, which, for reasons unknown to science kill him i guess it's heavy i guess it's heavy and hot they do talk about maintaining the temperature yeah i, I don't know he drowns in it is the like he drowns in it he's yeah. pushed under the mud and drowns sure if you're curious they achieved the look of this mud by adding food coloring to mashed potatoes which was a great idea in terms of visuals but they hadn't factored in how mashed potatoes would react after several days under hot studio lighting in terms of smell oh no it was apparently awful (laughs) i'm a little surprised they didn't just use mud yeah don't they have like spa grade mud for this maybe it costs more than mashed potatoes they were Uh, operating on a restricted budget (laughs) connery Bond pull. I'm having a lot of trouble not calling the character Sean Connery at this point. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Bond pulls the man's head out of the thing and hoses it down and realizes that it's not Blofeld. I love his little squirt gun. I love the squirt gun. The squirt gun is amazing. It's the dumbest little thing, but the design on the squirt gun is hilarious and I love it. At this point, Blofeld himself enters and explains, oh, that would have been me if you know, you'd waited longer because now he explains that he was turning him into a into a body double for exactly this purpose. George Gray has the widest smile. <laughs> Just his mouth goes to each side of his head. It's unsettling. Anyway, <laughs> he comes in with two goons. He instructs them to disarm Bond. Bond reaches into his pocket to get his gun. The guy who's holding him up says, ah, bah, bah, wait, 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 I'll do that. And goes up and reaches into Bond's pocket holster where Bond has essentially a mouse trap. <laughs> essentially. <laughs> Smashes the guy's fingers and he goes, ah. And then there's a quick fist fight and Bond grabs scalpels from the operating table and manages to basically fairly handily route the two guys who are attacking him. Blofeld grabs a larger scalpel for big incisions, I guess, <laughs> and lunges at Bond across the operating table and Bond grabs the surgical light from above, cranks it down on Blofeld's head, rendering him unconscious, and then he straps Blofeld to the gurney wheels him into the mud sulfur bath thing where he slides off the gurney under it as bond cranks up the heat and that's it then the cat is upset there's just a shot of blofeld's cat with a diamond collar going and then we cut to the opening titles because of the diamonds on the collar so there you go look at that he killed blofeld in like what five not even five minutes into the movie job done i'm sure blofeld is dead Mm Mm-hmm. Obviously. Certainly. Hey, if we're going to remake Goldfinger, guess who else is back? It's Shirley Bassey. Yes, she is. Singing Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah, and this song, again, pretty sweet. Yeah. I I think this song is pretty good. We'll rate it later, but this song kind of rocks. I mean, when you're starting with Shirley Bassey and John Barry, it's hard to, like, totally crater it Mm -hmm. but yeah this is this is pretty strong the opening titles are a little more subdued there's 
some amount of Binder's usual silhouette work, but a lot of it is close shots of diamonds, a lot of play with lighting, a lot of sort of prism refraction of light spinning through diamonds and jewels. And it's pretty cool. It's low key, like it's very understated compared to Binder's usual sort of check out this cavalcade of naked women silhouettes. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's nice. Yeah, I, I think it's a little underwhelming. I would agree with that. The song I love. I think the song is great. The song is not a belter. It's like this nice sultry ode to loving diamonds instead of men, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is like almost like groovy kind of it like, like relaxes you into the film almost. But I, I, I don't know. The visuals really kind of underwhelmed me in this one. They just didn't re- did not really do anything for me. You're right that it's understated, but it almost felt too understated. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't feel like it set itself apart from the other ones that the Binder had done in any way. It just felt like he was sort of half-assing it. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's frankly that a lot of Binder's opening titles feel kind of half-assed. <laughs> Well, fair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I I definitely agree with you. The song, by the way, like the like lyrically is lewd. Oh, yeah. If I may. Go ahead. Diamonds are forever. Hold one up and then caress it. Touch it, stroke it, and undress it. Diamonds are forever sparkling round my little finger. Unlike men, the diamonds linger. <laughs> it's not even talking about romantic love it's talking about diamonds are better than sex oh yeah there is a great quote noted on the wikipedia article for this movie saying that in an interview for a show called james bond's greatest hits john barry apparently told shirley basie to imagine that she was singing about a penis uh yep and it completely comes through boy howdy does it ever good song though Mm -hmm. the titles end with a shot of a diamond and the camera then pulls back to a display case of various diamonds and we see M and Bond looking at them. This is the scene where it sort of hit me kind of how much Connery had aged since the early Bond films, which is fine. You're allowed to age. It's been 10 years. But the way that they play off each other in this scene has less of the superior and scrappy agent from previous scenes this m gets some kicks in on bond later in this scene which is entertaining but in this moment when they're talking about diamonds it's like this is two old men who don't give a crap about diamonds yeah it's just the way that connery carries himself in this moment and he and m are just like and i'm just like this is weird it is a little yeah you're right the it didn't strike me at the time, but the scene where they where he kind of digs at Bond it does play a little differently because the like the situation is is that he goes to get a drink like Bond goes to get a drink and identifies it's it's Sherry, I think. And he identifies the vintage M is like Sherry doesn't have a vintage. And Bond is like, no, no, I'm I'm identifying the vintage that was used to make the Sherry. It's a 51, I believe. And 1851 and that like their host is like, oh, quite right. And, and M is kind of put out and then he gets asked, it's like, all right, do you know anything about diamonds? And he's like, mm, I don't know. They're they're pretty, I guess. Not much. They're mined mostly in Africa. Other than that, I don't know much. And M is just like, well, good to hear there's some subject you're not an expert in. <laughs> and he just feels really put out by Bond. Like he he doesn't actually feel like he's being the sort of like superior not putting up with his antics in this one. He just feels like he's offended. Yeah, they act a little more like old chums ripping into one another than, you know, the head of MI6 and the double yeah. agent. But anyway, M and Bond are meeting with the head of a diamond syndicate essentially and bond is sort of questioning that he's like why are we meeting with like a corporation essentially like it's not Mm. de beers but maybe it's supposed to be de beers right am is like well look blofeld's dead so you've dealt with that finally it's time to you know show up to work and get some stuff done and these people feel like they need our help so we're going to talk to them so obviously they feel like there's some sort of reason that mi6 should be involved in whatever's happening diamond wise and he explains well he explains how the whole diamond process works you know how they're 
mined, how they're brought to market, and it's intercut with footage of this. So we see a South African diamond mine, and as he's describing how well they look after their staff, we see various members of the mine sneak little diamonds into their mouths or their socks. One of them puts it in his mouth, and then we cut to a dentist extracting this diamond and giving him a bunch of money. As he's describing how above board everything is, we are being shown the trail of how these are all being smuggled out. Right. Did you notice that there's a chunk of his narration in here that is repeated? Okay, that was precisely what I was going to bring up because I literally have it written down. There's a weird piece of repeated dialogue in this diamond mine VO. <laughs> I, had to, I had to rewind because I thought I was going mad. <laughs> I did too. I did the same thing. Okay, good. I think I watched it three times just because I was like, am I just parsing the words wrong? No, no, he fully says that twice. But sorry to everyone listening. Now, when you watch this, you're never going to be able to unhear it. it. It was very strange. It is. One little visual gag I like, which is the guy, there's the guy at the dentist and the dentist is like digging around and he pulls the diamond out of his mouth and then hands him the money and he turns around and walks away. And then there's another guy waiting. And as soon as the chair is open and he sort of motions him over, he smiles this big smile full of perfect teeth. Yeah. Like he's, (laughs) he's seen this dentist a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then we actually get a full scene in the middle of this man's narration. You know what else OHMSS was missing? We had Irma Boont, but we didn't have iconic, entertaining henchmen. Ah. We get a scene in the middle of this narration with Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. I love Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. I don't know how you feel about them. I think they're great. They are certainly iconic. I don't know. that I, I sort of go both ways on them. They are iconic, and they're certainly the one thing in this movie that really stands out strong. Mm-hmm. So... Depending on how you how you respond to them as a viewer, I think will affect your enjoyment of the movie one way or the other. They are very creepy and unsettling, though. Yeah, and it has to be said that the movie is not particularly subtle with the fact that they are a gay couple. And it's very obvious for them to be an out gay couple in a movie in 1971 and be irredeemably evil is not good. That is a bad look. Yeah. And they are just like made to be really creepy and unsettling. I mean, they're assassins, but they're also just the way they talk to each other, like always using their first names and all or their full names and always referring to each other as Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid and like finishing each other's sentences or always having the right answer for the thing that the other one just said. They are... I don't, I don't know what the right word is. They're definitely way unsettling. Yes. They are super unsettling. Yeah. Like they're not presented as normal. And I don't mean that in the sense that like they are mentally deficient in any way, just that they have a really unsettling presence and interaction with each other. Which luckily is not presented in a way that they are creepy and upsetting because they are gay. Thankfully, they are just creepy and upsetting people. And also seemingly... A loving couple. Now, that's sort of inseparable that the first possibly only time to memory that there's been anyone gay in the Bond franchise, Mm -hmm. that they are supremely unsettling creepos. Again, that's bad, but at least it's not presented that they are deviants because of their homosexuality. They're just gay and also profoundly upsetting yeah the association is unfortunate yes but it doesn't it doesn't seem i mean i'm not up to speed on my 1970s era or early 1970s era gay stereotypes but it doesn't appear at least from a modern perspective it's not a causal Mm -hmm. indication Mr. Kidd is played by Putter Smith, who is a jazz musician who's like not an actor, like played with Thelonious Monk and Duke Ellington and a bunch of different acts. And the director saw him performing, like playing jazz and was like, you'd be great as a creepy henchman. (laughs) Just what I want to hear from a casting director. Yeah. Mr. Wint, it's funny because I was like, boy, this guy's creepy. He looks like he looks like Crispin Glover. Wow. Wow, this guy looks. But this is 1971. He can't be Crispin Glover. No, he's Bruce Glover. He's Crispin Glover's dad. Ah, 
that that explains it actually yeah you're right i hadn't made that connection until you just said it and was like oh wow he does look like crispin glover yeah so there you go and it seems like they sort of came up with that characterization of them as a couple themselves just looking at sort of how they were written to be to the way that they talked and using their full names and everything and they were like we're a couple aren't we yeah so they you know played that up and at the end of this scene they walk away holding hands there's a bit later where mr kid comments that bond's co-star played by jill st john is very attractive and mr wint just sort of stares at him very jealously in an interview bruce glover said that he played mr wint as very possessive of his kind of dopey partner right it was a little moment that i kind of like just because i guess because it's interesting because they're probably the most interesting characters in this movie oh by a long shot for better or worse mr wint and mr kid are as i say incredibly iconic and probably the standouts of this film they are part of the through line of the whole film they are present from essentially the very beginning to the very end they are the like the hallmark of this movie in many ways, I think. So calling them the most interesting thing in the film, I, I don't find that controversial at all. Hmm. When we first see them, they are admiring a scorpion and how great scorpions are at killing. They are meeting in the middle of a desert. It's meant to be South Africa. It was shot near Nevada, but it's meant to be South Africa. They're meeting the dentist who we just saw. So again, we're hearing this narration from the guy at the Diamond Syndicate talking about how amazing their whole pipeline is. And we're seeing a man steal a diamond from the mine and pass it off to the dentist. And then the dentist meeting with well, he's meant to be meeting with his contact, and he says, wait a minute, who the hell are you? And he pull, he gets ready to pull a gun out, and they go, oh, your, your man couldn't be here. He sent us. We have your payment. Everything's fine. And so he goes, okay, sure. And they make the exchange, and then Mr. Kidd feigns a toothache, and Mr. Wint says, I'm sorry, would you, would you be so kind as to just take a quick look? And while the dentist is inspecting Mr. Kidd's mouth, Mr. Wint drops the scorpion down the back of his shirt, there was an alternate take where he rammed it into his mouth, but it looked really stupid. Ugh. So he dies immediately and they hide the body in just enough time for his contact to arrive. And then they walk up and say, oh, I'm sorry, the dentist couldn't be here. We're here instead. Here's the diamonds. And they pass off the dentist's case to the man in the helicopter and the helicopter gets about 200 yards away and explodes so mr wint and mr kid inserted themselves into the middle of this trade-off taking out both participants in this chain because basically what they're going to be doing over the next little bit of the movie is they have been facilitating stealing contraband diamonds for specter it's for blofeld specter doesn't get mentioned really in this movie but it's for <laughs> Blofeld for Spectre. Yeah, I, I literally just now, as I'm talking, realized that, that they don't mention Spectre. But anyway, they have all the diamonds they need. So Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid are tying up all the loose ends, shall we say. Right. They proceed from there to a little school. Yeah, they cut briefly back to the Diamond Syndicate guy, but then we go to a school in South Africa. Christian, she's teaching the Bible. There's a big cross on the wall. And Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid show up to talk to her because she now has to go to Amsterdam to pass the diamonds off to the next step, essentially. And then we go back yet again to Ammon Bond at the Diamond Syndicate. And this is where Bond learns that his destination is also Amsterdam, as uh, as he is going to be following up on this smuggling ring, and he is to make contact... No, sorry, he is to take the place of peter franks mm -hmm. who they believe is the next step in this diamond smuggling ring this line from m i do like because bond asks if they have any idea who the contact in amsterdam is and m just says we do operate in your absence <laughs> by which of course they mean sean connery's absence but anyway there's a brief scene it's kind of great because it's played without a lot of explanation of what's going on of peter franks being pulled over at customs asked to go in for a customs inspection leaving his car and then bond gets into his car and money penny disguised as a customs agent shows up to hand him his fresh passport that says peter franks but has bond's picture in it right the transition as bond drives away is both really efficient and really cute he drives off and the camera pans over to 
a sign with a hovercraft printed on it. And then it cuts to the hovercraft pulling away. Yeah, you know what's cool in 1971? Hovercrafts. Hovercrafts are still cool. I know. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we see the hovercraft take him away from england and then we cut to a canal boat in amsterdam it's like a tour you know they're like and we see over here on the left and they're sort of pointing out that was a terrible dutch accent ignore me but anyway they're pointing out <laughs> fun things to see on this historic canal tour and you know if you all look to your left you'll see a body being dredged out of the canal and it turns out that it's the old lady that we just saw in the school in south africa and we cut to mr wint and mr kid on a bridge watching this to give you an idea of how creepy they are she was sort of playing up she's like oh and where are we going this time and they're like well we're sending you to amsterdam and she's like oh lovely i'll have to get some photos to bring back for the children you know because she's also evil because she's part of this smuggling operation so they're pulling her body out of the canal and mr kid is taking pictures on his camera and as he's winding the film he's like well she did say she wanted photos for the children oh that's so kind of you to think of mr kid thank you mr wint you know that's the sort of creep factor that these two are operating on yeah so who's next on their list well that would be peter frank's who we see in name only arriving in Amsterdam in the background of their shot. Actually, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So he goes and makes contact with T case, who we will find out is named Tiffany case after a little bit of business with bond asking this woman that he meets when Mr. Case will be back. And she says, no, no, there's no Mr. Case. I'm the contact. There's this whole bit of business where as bond arrives, he sees a blonde woman in her underwear disappear into the next room. And then she returns as a brunette, suggests he get himself a drink. And then she grabs his glass and goes, oh, I'll make sure to get you some ice and goes into the next room where she dusts the glass for his fingerprint and takes a picture of it, then puts ice in the glass, rubs the fingerprint off, takes it back, gives it to him, then says that she's actually getting a dress because she's still wearing like a negligee. I think Bond calls it a lovely nothing she's wearing. <laughs> she goes back in the next room, takes the picture, opens her closet. There's like a whole supercomputer in there, runs the fingerprint and it returns as Peter Franks. Back in the other room, Bond is enjoying his drink, smells the, wordlessly, which I like, smells the glass and sort of smiles to himself because he realizes, ah, oh, she's dusted this for Prince. OK, cool. All right, sure. And then she comes back in a third time now as a redhead, which is further commented on. And he's trying to, you know, put on the charm. And she's like, that's, this is not that's 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 not what this relationship is. We need you to move a bunch of diamonds. And he's like, OK, sure. How many diamonds? And she says some ridiculous number of carats worth of diamonds. He balks at it a little bit. And she's like, yeah, that's why we're paying you 50,000. We're not just asking you to move like a ring here. And he's like, OK, uh, well, I'll do it. And she's like, OK, great. Well, you can you can come back later. And then we cut to Bond back in his hotel room peeling off a fake thumb skin thing as he's on the phone to Q basically being like, you know what, Q, I thought this was stupid, but boy, it worked out terrifically. <laughs> this is this is all we see of Q in this movie, too. And in the background, we see them lowering a pallet of rockets into the <laughs> front of a Aston Martin. But Q just sort of says, by the way, M's been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, Peter Franks escaped from customs. So you should probably. Hello. Hello, as we cut back to the hotel and see that Bond is gone because he's realized, oh, crap, my whole cover could be completely blown. <laughs> yeah, he then turns around and heads right back to Tiffany Case's place, gets there basically just as Franks is walking up the stoop to buzz himself in and catches up with him. Franks buzzes the thing and Bond like pretends like he's fishing out his keys Frank's like buzzes case and is like it's it's Frank's and she's like all right come on up and of course buzzes the door open so Bond plays this off as like oh convenient I'll just open the door and he like lets him in he also puts on like a really ridiculous Dutch accent he's like oh you are English it might have been worse than mine I don't know it was probably worse than yours uh, I also speak English who is your floor <laughs> <laughs> who is your floor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so they both get into the elevator together. Frank's is like, it's the third floor. So he, he, he 
Bond presses the third floor button and then gets into the back of the elevator. This is one of those elevators that's in the middle of a staircase that goes around it all the way up. And it's sort of windows. It's like open on one side and then windows on the other three sides. It's a very sort of open elevator with the kind of door that like you you have to manually slide it closed. Yeah, like the grating, Mm -hmm. the the sort of like grill style door. I was going to say like the Maritime Museum downtown. And that's useful for like 12 listeners. (laughs) You've probably seen elevators like this. Yes. It's also very small, and both of these men are six foot two. Yeah. Bond goes to incapacitate Franks without making a ruckus, and he winds up to take a punch at him, accidentally, like, cracks the window with his elbow, which alerts Franks. Franks turns around, and a fight ensues. The The fight in this elevator is actually pretty good. A pretty sweet close quarters fight. They make more noise than you can imagine mm-hmm. as they break every window in this elevator. Franks manages to pull his gun out, and there, like a fight over the gun ensues. The gun goes off. Bond gets pinned down in such a way that like the elevator is rising towards a landing, and and his head is going to get crushed. But he manages to sort of get out of it at the last second. As they reach the top, he manages to to subdue Franks after blinding him with a fire extinguisher. Right, he blinds him with a fire extinguisher and throws him over the landing. Then sort of comes down, and of course Tiffany has walked out into the hallway at this point. She can hear all this racket going on. He he gets down to the third floor and bends over. And she's like, well, who is that? What's like, what's going on? And Bond swaps the identification. So he's like, oh, I don't know. But he tried to kill me in the elevator. And he pulls out his wallet and shows it to her. And she's like, you just killed James Bond. You don't kill James Bond. I love that James Bond is a known quantity. I mean, if you're running an international diamond smuggling ring for Blofeld, even if you don't necessarily know Blofeld, you, you probably... I think I've I've commented on this in the, the Honor Majesty Secret Service episode. If you're running an international diamond smuggling ring, you probably do your homework and look up who this James Bond fellow is in the 1970s version of the internet. Yeah. Luckily for Bond, Tiffany Case, whose name is a pun, by the way, it's because like Tiffany's like the jeweler, like a Tiffany case. It's because Bond makes a joke about it and it it's not a, like a modern reference. So it sort of sort of lands with a dull thud today. But her name is meant to be a pun. She doesn't know who Bond is. So she's like, oh, my God, you killed James Bond. Well, we got to get cracking if they sent Bond here. We got to get the diamonds moving tonight. Yeah. And it, it helps also that he only gives her the credit card, which, of course, has no photo associated with it so mm-hmm. she she doesn't have anything to confirm his like appearance against they proceed to smuggle the diamonds they bundle up the corpse of formerly peter franks and they put him in a coffin and bond stages himself as his brother and they fly him to the u.s with the diamonds inside they are at this point still being followed by mr wint and mr kid this is where mr kid comments that tiffany case is very attractive and mr wint gives him the stink eye upon arriving in the u.s they are met up at the airport because of course customs has to be done on the corpse bond has apparently been in contact with the authorities on both sides of the atlantic because none other than felix lighter is there at the airport, awaiting their arrival to pose as a customs agent. He starts, you know, poking around in the body. He feeds Bond a little bit of information and asks, you know, asks a few questions. Ultimately, is like, all right, I know the diamonds are in here, but where are they? To which Bond responds, elementary, my dear Felix. He does. Apparently, Cubby Broccoli hated that joke. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I had to look it up. The elementary canal for those uninitiated Uh is essentially the passage of the like the bowel and the intestines and the inside of a person the digestive tract so to speak or the lower digestive tract i guess apparently he thought nobody would get that joke he was right at the premiere two people in the front row burst out laughing and he said (laughs) big deal they're doctors It's the the inverse law of hilarity strikes again. Yeah. So this is Felix Leiter played by Norman Burton, 
who would play him ones of times. He looks completely different from other iterations of Felix, and we know that it's Felix because Sean Connery says, oh, hello, Felix. So that's how we know this is Felix later. Yeah. So the plan for recovering the diamonds goes as follows. They take the corpse to a little crematorium and funeral chapel in the middle of the desert. They bring him in, and the funeral director says a few words. Bond is the only person there. They have a, a brief ceremony as they put the, the coffin on the, the conveyor belt into the crematorium. They have a very tacky little situation, I will describe it as, where the, the control panel, like, they say a few words and then they press a button and dramatic music starts and then they press another button and a little door opens up and then they press another button and the conveyor belt wheels the coffin into the oven and then the door closes and then they light her up. The very uneasy people who are driving the hearse, who it seems like are going to just turn on Bond at any moment, which is kind of funny, are played by Mark Lawrence, a very distinctive, that guy, he played a lot of gangsters. The guy looks like he should play gangsters, and he did. He was in this movie. He also shows up in The Man with the Golden Gun, and he played a very similar role in a couple episodes of Star Trek. That makes that makes sense. I like the gangsters. We like I did sort of gloss over it, but as Felix is finishing up searching, he comments to Bond. It's like, so somebody sent the brain trust here to pick you up and it flips around to the hearse. And it's like these three very stereotypical gangsters waiting, sort of leaning against the hearse. And they pile like they pile the coffin into the hearse. And, and one of them was like, would you like to sit up front? Another one's like, rides much smoother up front. OK, I guess I'll sit up front. And he ends up sandwiched in between these two gangsters with a third sitting in the back with the coffin. And as they're driving away, one of them, one of them is like, so who's the stiff? It's like, oh, my brother. And the guy in the back is like, oh, I have a brother. <laughs> Doesn't he go like, who's the stiff? I the departed. Like... <laughs> One of the other gangsters, by the way, is played by Sid Haig, a very young Sid Haig, who would huh. be, he's been in a lot. He's been in a lot of stuff. He just passed away in September and he's been in a fabajillion things. <laughs> But yeah, so they get to the funeral home, Slumber Incorporated, so named for its founder, Morton Slumber. Morton Slumber. What a great name. Yeah. He has that 1960s television voice. He's just like, well, hello there. I'm Morton Slumber. Thank you for choosing Slumber Incorporated. And it's like, but you're having a conversation, but you're talking like you're on a radio. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they burn the coffin up. Everyone's playing this. Like, it's so weird. Everyone's playing their characters. Everyone's playing this super straight, like as if they're being watched, right? He's like, oh, it's a shame yeah. what happened to your brother. You know, you picked a very good coffin. We'll lay him to rest. I'll meet you in the next room with the urn. And he goes and he's like, here are your brother's remains. Bond peeks inside the urn. It's nothing but diamonds. He's like, you'll want to take him outside. You know, I've picked this place for the urn to go. It's the one with the curtains in front of it. At any time, anyone could just be like, oh, the thing's full of diamonds, though, hey? Because everyone knows. Everyone here is in on it, but no one is saying anything. Yeah. Bond takes the urn and goes out back, passing by two men who are paying their respects. It's Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. Bond puts the urn down, picks up a slumber incorporated envelope that is full of money, which is his pay, and then he gets clobbered over the head. And Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid put him into a coffin themselves meanwhile one of the other gangsters comes and picks up the urn from its little urn cubby and mr winton mr kid put bond in the coffin and start running it through the cremation device and pushing all the buttons they're taking very they're enjoying this they're taking care to do yes they do the music and everything and bond comes to while he's being cooked alive and it's very like how the hell is he gonna get out of this one what the hell what's what's going on and then yeah. the coffin gets ripped open and there's morton slumber and another one of the slumber inc people there or a, in this case an actual gangster and they're like hey what the hell franks those diamonds are phony. You know, now now the masks have come off and everyone's just fully open. Right. 
So Bond Bond retorts, you didn't pay me with real money either, so I guess we're at a bit of an impasse. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you wouldn't burn up 50,000 real dollars, would you? So you get me the real money and I'll get you the real diamonds. And he just like gets out of the coffin and walks out. Yeah, and they just sort of let him go because it's like, oh, I guess we kind of have to. He's got a point. Yeah. <laughs> Except it's like unclear if these two know that Mr. Winton, Mr. Kid did that. I guess, I guess they did. I. It's hard to say. I don't think so because the gangster is Shady Tree. Yeah who we haven't been introduced to yet, but will be the subsequent victim of Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd. So if it, like if they knew that Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd were going around murdering everybody up the line, I don't think Shady Tree would be too keen to be playing his part in this transaction. Mm-hmm. You're right. They do just sort of let him go, despite the fact that that whole exchange doesn't make any sense in context. Bond takes his money, which I guess is real, and books himself a hotel room, a very nice hotel room. And as he's sitting in his bathtub, flipping through the local entertainment guide, he sees a picture of, as you say, Shady Tree, the man who he just saw at Slumber Inc. And he's like, that's weird. I should follow up on that. (laughs) So he goes to the White House, which is a hotel, W-H- Y-T-E, named for its owner, Willard White, who is essentially Howard Hughes in that he's a recluse. And he goes to see the act of Shady Tree and his acorns. And the act of Shady Tree and his acorns is Shady Tree stands in the middle of the stage being an absolute curmudgeon telling terrible jokes while his acorns, which is two showgirls, stand on either arm, keeping him standing, (laughs) it seems. (laughs) It's quite a show it's very vegas in that it's not much of a show yeah so the show ends he goes down to his dressing room and mr wint and mr kid show up he doesn't know who they are yeah he doesn't know who they are they come in and they're like we have some suggestions for your material and he's like well i don't take suggestions and then we we just sort of cut away like there's a bit of a a dialogue between them but we don't see what happens in the scene there is actually more to that scene that was deleted okay it's on the dvd but mr kid has a lapel flower that shoots water and tree is like are you serious that's the one of the oldest jokes out there and then mr kid pulls out a gun points it at him and fires and it just is shoots out like the bang flag like the joker and he's like guys, you get, your material is terrible. Get out of my dressing room. And then he pulls the trigger a second time and it actually goes. <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. There's actually another deleted scene right here as well where Bond is walking through the casino and Sammy Davis Jr. is playing at the craps table as himself, like actual Sammy Davis Jr. He and the pit boss comment on how profoundly out of place Bond looks in his white tux. <laughs> It's honestly like a great scene and I'm sad that they cut it because it's like, oh, look, it's actually Sammy Davis Jr. because it's Vegas in the 70s. Right. But yeah, so Shady Tree gets offed by Wind and Kid as well. And then we have a, a scene a moment later where they are leaving and someone, I don't remember who it is, runs up. Bert Saxby. He's Willard White's casino manager. That's right. Who is, it will be revealed in cahoots with Blofeld, which Willard White is not. Right. So Saxby comes up to them is like, wait, wait, we need Tree alive. It turns out the diamonds were faked, which Wint and Kid respond. Oh, that's very dis- or very annoying. That's one of my favorite lines in the movie is Mr. Wint going, that's most annoying. And then, yeah, and then it, it cuts to a shot of Tree like dead on the floor in his dressing room. <laughs> yeah, it's just so understated. Says, oh, that's what a shame then. <laughs> <laughs> Back on the casino floor, some poor schlub is having bad luck at the craps table, much to the disappointment of his would-be date for the evening. Plenty O'Toole. Easily, 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 easily one of my favorite Bond girl names. (laughs) It's so on the nose, you can't help but love it. Well, especially her introduction, because she walks up with a dress cut low to her navel, saying, Hi, I'm Plenty. And Bond just goes, You sure are. And she volunteers, Plenty O'Toole. And he, like, like almost, like, visibly stumbled, like the... Like when you're walking upstairs and there's one less stair than you think. It's like that, but yeah. in his face. This is what you're talking about when you're, like, self-parody. Oh, yeah. She hears him making big bets. Saxby, rather, comes over and is like, You don't 
have the credit for that. And he's like, oh, no, no, I do. And he pulls out the slumber ink envelope. So Saxby then realizes who it is and goes, oh, wait, no, this guy's credit's okay. He wins a bunch of money and he and Plenty go on a dinner date. Okay, so there are a bunch of things in the scene that I like. One is just the, like, Bond is super out of place here. And so he walks up to the craps table and is like, I'd like to raise the limit to 2000 a bet and I'd like $50,000 in chips. And, like, everybody at the table looks at him. Sir, this is the penny table. What's wrong with you? Because he's, like, he's such a high roller. Every time he's been in a casino up till now, he's been playing with huge sums of money. And, I don't know, my experience of walking the casino floor in a casino in Las Vegas is that the bet values are rated in tens, not tens of thousands. So there's that whole incongruity there that's that's just fun. Bond is used to being in casinos in Monaco and Monte Carlo. And I think part of the reason that this doesn't quite land Vegas as a location is because Vegas is kind of gross. Yeah. I mean, it certainly feels kind of cheap and like tacky by comparison to every casino we've ever seen him in. Yeah, it just seems very strange. It's a strange place for Bond to be. Anyway, she talks about how she's going to be his good luck charm and he starts absolutely crushing it. And she's like, oh, is that how this game works? (laughs) You know, like she's like unaware of how craps functions. He's like, oh, you've played this before. Meanwhile, Saxby goes in the back, calls Willard White on the phone, who we hear, and shows that bond is on the cameras and willard white comments you know like well whatever take care of him bond and plenty well they go on a dinner date in a deleted scene which is i've confused myself but they actually just go straight to bond's room they walk in the door and plenty starts kissing bond and bond sort of like undoes her dress and it falls to the floor she basically like excuses herself from the room and is like runs into the bedroom bond like picks her dress up off the floor and puts it on chair and goes to take his coat off and the lights come on and one of the gangsters is there holding a gun to him. And then we suddenly hear protestations from Plenty in the other room. She's like, hey, what gives? What's going on? As another gangster ushers her out of the bedroom, picks her up and heaves her out the window. Where she falls several stories and manages to safely land in the pool. And Bond looks at the gangster, says, oh, nice, nice shot with the pool there. And the gangster's like, I didn't know there was a pool. So at this point, he's escorted into the bedroom. He actually goes to fight them and they just back out of the room and he's like really confused and then realizes the door to his bedroom is open. So he makes his way into the bedroom. Who is there but Tiffany Case? Tiffany Case is not a good character. (laughs) Yes, you're right. (laughs) She barely does anything and spends most of the movie sitting on beds or couches wearing not very much, being very attractive, and talking to Bond like she's going to potentially make something happen, but she never does. There's no payoff to show that Tiffany Case is actually as well-connected or powerful as she purports to be, and she doesn't affect anything. Yeah, the movie is not very kind to tiffany case no the writing particularly in the later half like through the first portion of the film you feel a little bit like okay she's a well-connected diamond smuggler she's wealthy and powerful and she refers to bond as hired help early in the film you know she reads like a character that's in control and as the movie continues that characterization fades away as she is progressively more just along for the ride with bond and blofeld neither of whom really have any time for her and neither of whom are very kind to her Mm -hmm. in this scene she grills bond about like where you know where the real diamonds and he's like oh okay well i I, you know the the real diamonds are on the way my friend felix is sending them why don't we you know they're they're clearly killing people who have been involved in the smuggling ring why don't we collect the diamonds and run away together we can take the diamonds and finance our escape he's like i'll go get the diamonds you go get a car and we'll meet up later and she's like nah uh I will go get the diamonds, you go get a car, then we will meet up, to which Bond agrees. During that scene, they also have sex. The conversation you're describing happens on either side of them having sex. So she asks him where the diamonds are, and he says, well, have you ever been to the circus? And we cut to Circus Circus, the casino, Circus Circus in Vegas, where they do trapeze acts and whatnot, and it's all themed like a circus. And so Bond is up in like the catwalk area, you know, where they're watching to make sure people aren't cheating. He's up there with Felix and a whole bunch of agents watching her go and and collect the diamonds, which is done in a really convoluted way where she she's told to go to a 
blackjack table. The guy gives her a card that says, why don't you go play the water gun game? So then she goes to the water gun game and the guy, much to the disappointment of the small child beside her, the guy fixes the water gun game so that she wins. And then he gives her a big stuffed animal that the diamonds are inside of. To the even further consternation of the the small child next to her. Because he's like, you have to win like five times to get one that big. What the heck? What gives? What's going on? There's a visual gag of an elephant pulling a one-armed bandit and winning the jackpot. A couple generic thugs start following her around and she gets kind of freaked out by it. So she ducks into a really problematic sideshow it is a really problematic sideshow yeah but they lose her in there and she manages to escape meaning that they've lost her completely and the diamonds Mm -hmm. and bond is waiting at their rendezvous point and felix rocks up and goes wait is she here she's not here is she and bond goes felix don't tell me you lost the diamonds and he indeed did so then we cut to tiffany case's house in vegas and she arrives home bond is already there waiting for her and plenty o'toole is dead in case's pool because someone broke into her house and thought it was case yeah because she was like she had broken in hadn't she yes if you're confused as you should be there is another deleted scene where plenty o'toole lets herself back into bond's room soaking wet from the pool to get her clothes sees bond and case having sex is mad and riffles through case's purse to find her credit card or something with her address and then she breaks into case's house out of a jealous revenge i guess it doesn't make a lot more sense but at least goes a little further to explaining what the hell plenty o'toole is doing at tiffany case's house Mm -hmm. but also i don't know who killed o'toole because mr wint and mr kid know who tiffany case is yeah so this actually doesn't make sense to me you know what they did a better job of remaking goldfinger than they thought (laughs) (laughs) that really caught me off guard so anyhow bond has a line it's like well i guess she broke in and and whoever was here to kill you killed her so you better come with me the offer's still open you better come with me and she agrees she and bond hop in a car she's ditched the diamonds in a locker at the airport so they watch and someone picks it up takes it outside hands it off to somebody in a van they follow the van to a gas station the van's being driven by bert saxby he gets out and goes inside and trades off with this guy named metz who's a scientist metz who doesn't know who tiffany case is is now driving the van. She boxes him in at the gas station. There's a whole business with her, like, refusing to move until the guy fills up her tank. It's a little weird. As a cover for Bond climbing in, somehow unnoticed, into the back of the van. And once he's done that, she moves out of the way. So then Metz takes off for wherever he's going. Case follows him, but Bond is now in the back of the van. So you say somehow unnoticed. Not just somehow unnoticed by Metz who we can understand is distracted by the car parked right in front of him and like honking his horn because he wants to leave. But there's a car right behind his van with a guy in the driver's seat as Bond is climbing into the back of this van. Who doesn't think to say like, hey, there's a guy just climbed into the back of your van. (laughs) So Metz drives way, way out of town to a Willard White facility. It says Willard White Tektronics, I think. He drives the van in to a little building there, scans a key card, and then the van descends on an elevator to like the secret underground bunker of this facility. And he takes the diamonds and goes inside. And now it's time for Bond to do a little social engineering. Mm-hmm. He basically is like trying to break in. He sees a guy coming like a a scientist looking guy coming. And so he makes a game that sort of looks like he's trying to fumble for his key card. When the guy walks up, he's like, oh, I've never seen you around here before. And the guy's like, oh, well, I've been here for three years and introduces himself. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. He's Klaus Hergesheimer from G Division. That's right. Klaus Hergesheimer from G Division. He opens the door while Bond is still fiddling for his ostensible key card. Klaus ultimately is like, well, gotta go check the radiation shields. Want to make sure that everybody 
Bonnie's got the radiation shields on. A- actually, where's yours? And Bond is like, well, I've been waiting for several days for you guys to deliver them. And he's like, oh, geez, sorry about that. I, th- I think I've got a spare one here. And he pulls one out and clips it on to, to Bond's lapel. And he's like, great. I-, I feel much safer with this attached. They part ways. The next scene, we see Bond now in a lab coat, which he, a slightly ill-fitting lab coat, walk into Metz's lab. Mm-hmm. And start just sort of nosing around and eavesdropping on the conversation, only to be noticed basically immediately by Metz. It's like, who are you? It's like, well, I'm Klaus Hergesheimer from G Division. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just here to check the radiation shields. And Metz is like, no, you're here distracting me. This is very important business. You need to get out of here. You shouldn't be in here. And he's like, well, I have a job. I have to do it. I'm just doing my my job man get out of my face and he's like well finish what you're doing and then get out of here so bond sort of like continues snooping around and like eavesdrops on their conversation as they continue until such a time as he gets the information he needs what what he finds while in there is that they're putting the diamonds into the reflecting dish of a satellite and Mm -hmm. he stumbles across a tape of scottish marches like a cassette tape of (laughs) marching band music which he Sort of is like, that's that's weird. And then as soon as he leaves, Klaus Hergesheimer from G Division walks in the other door. And is like, hi, I'm Klaus Hergesheimer from G Division here to check your radiation shields. And everybody just stares at him like he's got a horn on his head. Having realized that he's been made, Bond, I don't know how he actually realizes he's been made, but Bond decides that it's time to make an escape, which... <laughs> We abruptly cut to the moon landing, which is to say we cut to a set where they presumably faked the moon landing. Yeah, maybe? It's hard to say. Like, I don't understand. So I don't understand anything about this. It's hilarious. And it's one of the highlights of the movie for certain definitions of highlight. But none of this scene makes sense. Bond is like hiding behind a a moon dune in the background and gets made like somebody's like there he is and and he like runs through this set where there are two people in full-blown like spacesuits moving very slowly Mm -hmm. but this is 1971 the moon landing's already happened why are they still faking the moon landing right and then bond runs across this moon set at full speed and the two astronauts both react in slow motion yeah they're like no oh stop. no and like one of them grabs at him but grabs at him in slow motion completely unable to get they're him really in character yeah they're like staying in character and so bond runs over to the moon buggy which is the most ridiculous moon buggy you've ever seen it's based on the actual lunar lander but then they were like that doesn't look interesting enough <laughs> Let's make it taller, put a bubble on it, and give it really goofy, flaily robot arms and send it out (laughs) into the Nevada desert. And send it out into the Nevada desert he does. Bond hops in, mashes every button until he can figure out how to make the thing run, and then drives it through a wall and out into the Nevada desert. He drives this moon buggy essentially across the compound as security on ATVs, like little tri-wheel ATVs, chase him. He manages to lose them when one of them takes a jump and bails. Bond, like, turns around a corner, basically, and hops out of the moon buggy, leaving it driving off in into the distance and just stays hidden behind a rock as the other two security guards go by chasing the moon buggy still thinking he's inside and then he like cold clocks the the one security guard that's fallen off his bike as he's getting back on and he steals the tri-wheel rides it back to tiffany's car and then they hop in the car and and hightail it back to town the moon buggy prop was super unreliable because its wheels kept falling off that does not surprise me. there's a shot actually where one of the cars that's chasing him earlier in the scene does a bunch of flips and you can see one of the moon buggy wheels rolling through the front of shot (laughs) (laughs) like the moon buggy got through shot and collapsed and one of its wheels like rolled back into frame (laughs) it's really funny This movie destroys so many Ford cars. (laughs) It really does. In fact, I would say that we're about to come up to probably the best part of the movie, which is the car chase through Las Vegas. They get back into town. 
the thing is, we will discover Blofeld is using Willard White's connections to basically have all this power and technology in Las Vegas. And Willard White has a lot of connections, including to the sheriff. And so as soon as they get back into town, they're immediately spotted as the only people driving. Quick, we need to go to the Internet Movie Car Database. It's a Ford Mustang. Okay. In fact, it's a 1971 Mustang Mach 1. I know this because of a piece of trivia. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that they wreck a lot of Ford cars. They do wreck a lot of Ford cars specifically. The arrangement that they had with Ford was that they would be allowed to use and wreck all these Ford cars as long as Connery himself drove a Ford in the movie. They got around it by giving Tiffany the Mustang and then having Bond drive it in the car chase. This entire sequence is just, I mean, it's the Keystone Cops, really. It's just driving around and how idiotic can we make the Las Vegas Sheriff's Department or the Highway Patrol or whomever it is. I think it's two different different police departments. How stupid can we make them look? Yeah, it's the Las Vegas PD and the sheriff specifically. And so there's just there's a lot of driving around there. I do appreciate I actually should have mentioned the fight scene in the elevator with Peter Franks. Wow, it's so refreshing to have a, a really nicely edited fight scene. I could really tell what was happening in that scene. <laughs> that was a good fight scene. This is a fun car chase. It I love the bit where they run in circles around a parking lot and manage to make it interesting. They like do a couple different loops in different directions and just ruin a whole bunch of different cars in the process. I don't know. I like the parking lot moment. I'm less gunned about the whole car chase, with the exception of the one stunt, the iconic stunt in this one. Yes. I mean, this car chase is certainly the part that people remember from Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah. And it's... It's good. It's not the best car chase in a Bond movie. It's not even the best car chase in a parking garage in a Bond movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a fun little like action scene. We get to watch some local cops have their days ruined, as will happen from Bond movie to Bond movie. They're on the run from the police, of course. Tiffany is like, we got the cops on us now. Think we're in real trouble. To which Bond responds, oh no, I have a friend named Felix who can fix anything. The real highlight of this scene is is towards the end where they are being chased like they have managed to lose the Las Vegas Police Department by basically crashing them all into one another. Mm -hmm. The sheriff who's down on the strip, he sees them go by and then he sees the police go by and he's like, oh, OK, well, we don't have to respond. The, the police have got it taken care of. We cut to a shot of the sheriff being like, Bob's got him. Hey, Bob, you got him? Bob? I'm sure Bob's got him. <laughs> and then the Mustang drives by. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Sheriff, Sheriff, that's them. They, of course, hop in, go to chase Bond down. Bond is like, geez, we, you know, we're, we're back in a car chase again and makes a turn into an alley that says dead end. And the sheriff chases him in behind and is like, ha ha, I've got him now. Bond hits a ramp, tilts the car up on two wheels at an angle and fits it into the narrowed section of the alley up ahead and comes out the other side unscathed. The sheriff tries the same thing and immediately flips his car in the alley. So many fun things to talk about here. First of all, the stunt driver just did that. Yeah. Like that's a real stunt that was done with an actual car. So that's very impressive. Secondly, when they shot the car exiting the alley the first time, there were massive crowds there to watch them filming it, really awkwardly like cordoned off like a block down the road. So they were like, well, we can't use this footage because it really clearly being filmed so they sent another stunt team back to shoot a pickup and that stunt team couldn't do the two wheels thing so then they found another stunt team and they successfully did the two wheels thing and got it coming out of the alleyway on an empty street and everything is great except that the car goes into the small alley with its passenger side wheels down and came out of the alley with its driver side wheels down <laughs> So the way they solved it is in the middle of the shot, they did this insert on the soundstage of close-ups of Tiffany Case on a really canted Dutch angle one direction. And then the camera rocks to the other side as it slides over to the other side of the car featuring Bond, implying that at some point <laughs> in that narrow alley, they changed which wheels the car was on. 
<laughs> so that the continuity worked for when it came out the other side. It's not explained what that looked like. We only see it from the inside of the car. It makes absolutely <laughs> no physical sense. <laughs> but it worked to cover the continuity. Only barely. <laughs> I I love that. It's ridiculous and stupid, but I love it. It's a really great stunt. They clearly do it. it. Like It's just a fun stunt. I like that stunt a lot. Then we cut to a fish because Bond and Tiffany Case are now in the bridal suite at Willard White's hotel on a bed that is also a fish tank, which seems very difficult to maintain, but sure. So I have problems with this bed that's also a fish tank. <laughs> no kidding. My main problem is that for the most of the time that we see it, Tiffany is like sitting Sitting in it with like a fur coat on and leaning on a like an invisible pillow, basically vinyl inflatable pillow that's clear. It basically looks like a giant fish filled ashtray. Yes, because where I assume the mattress is meant to be, there is not a mattress. So she's just sitting in this plastic dish. It looks supremely uncomfortable. Yeah, there's no bed there. It's just a dish. Yeah. And I like I assume my as I say, my assumption is that they removed the, the mattress because it made the shot look less good and they wanted to show off the fish tank. And so their compromise was that they put the vinyl pillow in behind it so that she wasn't just leaning against a plexiglass wall. But it looks really awkward. It's like cool because it's a fish tank, but it looks really awkward. They're both nude in this scene. It's implied they just had sex. I can't fathom had so many hard corners. Yeah. It's either flat, hard, plastic or there's corners this looks like a miserable place to have sex <laughs> mercifully felix lighter arrives and says that he's got men stationed outside both doors because of course the bridal suite is two stories for some reason this is a set by the way and bond wants to talk to willard white and felix is like i even i can't do that like the president can't get willard white to talk to him if he wanted so i don't know what you think i'd be able to and bond sort of goes okay sure and finishes because bond's getting dressed in, in his tux he walks over to a giant flower arrangement by the window snaps off a red carnation tucks it into his lapel and raises the blinds and tiffany's like wait what where are you going and he says oh, i'm just gonna pop upstairs and talk to willard white and steps out the window onto the roof and he want, walks across the roof and he walks across the roof to the exterior elevator and as it comes up the building steps onto the roof of the outside elevator sniffing his carnation casually as if this is not a big deal rides the outside of the elevator up to the top of the hotel there's a great shot here of him like leaning back with one hand on the rail mm -hmm. it's super suave it's very cool absolutely you're right he he is treating it like this is nothing totally cat perfectly normal way to ride an elevator so he gets to the top of the elevator briefly worries that he's about to be crushed <laughs> <laughs> because the elevator stops a little closer to the roof than he anticipated but as it turns around and goes away he grabs onto like a service ladder along the side at the top of the building uses that to sort of finagle his way out onto a ledge and pulls out a grapple hook fires a grapple bolt at one part of the wall with a, a rope attached and it locks into the wall and then he fires another one at a different point in the wall the ropes are attached to his belt and so he swings himself out until he sort of comes to rest dangling from the two connection points and then he releases one of them which allows him to swing around the side of the building as he sort of like comes to a stop he uses like a climbing rig or whatever he, he has in his tuxedo pants to pull himself up to the rooftop what a silly sequence by the way <laughs> oh yeah it's great this is very bond but it's very silly he discards his like climbing regalia finds some shutters in a ceiling skylight, removes the shutters, and essentially lets himself into the penthouse of none other than Willard White himself. He falls through the skylight onto the toilet, in fact, where <laughs> Willard White has an amazing chair, an amazing, I'm sorry, an amazing toilet. It's, it's a, a throne. wooden throne. There's newspapers there. There's radios everywhere. There's control panels for the multiple monitors he has watching his casino. Because Willard White hasn't been seen in five years. He's an incredibly powerful man and supremely reclusive. And people are constantly inviting him to things, asking him for his endorsement of things. He's very friendly. He's spoken to people on the phone this whole time. People still talk to him, but he has not been seen. Bond plays around with the control panel until one of the monitors shows 
shows him because there's a camera in the bathroom. And as soon as he's visible on the monitors, you hear Willard White come over the speaker going like, well, hey there, Mr. Bond, how's it going? I think you should come and uh, meet me face to face in the next room now. Take your time, you know, like really sort of affable and friendly. Finish your business. Bond goes into the next room where he sees, well, for one thing, an absolutely astonishing set. <laughs> it is. This is a really amazing set. This is very classic Bond. It's. I think this is the only like really like mega classic Bond set in this movie. And to your observation in a previous one, it's got a lot of clean angular lines and belongs to Blofeld. I mean, it belongs to Willard White, but who should turn around in the chair at the end of the room but Blofeld, who we all definitely thought was dead. Definitely. And he says, he turns around and says in Willard White's voice, well, hello there, Mr. Bond. And... It's now apparent that he's taken over Willard White's sort of empire. And then what's weird is he says, hello, Mr. Bond. And then a different Blofeld in a different part of the room also says, hello, Mr. Bond, and comes down the stairs. Blofeld explains, oh, yes, no, that man you killed was one of my was one of my doubles. So the, the tension here is that Bond doesn't know which of these is a double. I, I mean, presumably if he had the capability, he could just kill both of them. Yes, but he doesn't have the capability. Not that that stops him from trying. The bits of information that we get in this scene are, well, there's more than one Blofeld, and Blofeld has taken over the Empire of Willard White, and he's done that by using a voice box to alter the sound of Blofeld's voice to sound like White, so that when he's on the phone, he sounds like White. I'm not sure that's how a voice box works. It's like this big mechanism that he turns on when he goes to use the phone, but apparently it changes the sound of his voice in the room. It's very science fiction. It is very science fiction. We also learn that the second Blofeld sounds like the first Blofeld because he has like a miniaturized version of it implanted in his neck. It's very science fiction. Embedded in the floor, like recessed in the floor under glass, is a map of Willard White's empire with all of the different installations around the country, which will come up later. And as they're discussing the extent of White's empire and looking at this map, Bond sort of wanders around and there's a model of a rocket ship, which he admires the fine point on. And then he goes back towards it because you think he's going to grab it as a weapon. And Blofeld is like, don't do that by the way let's not let's not insult all of us by you <laughs> thinking you're gonna kill me with with that rocket ship bond's plan by the way to determine which the real blofeld is is to kick the cat and whichever blofeld so <laughs> the implication is he's kicks the cat and whichever Blofeld the cat runs to is the real Blofeld, except that bond just fully kicks the cat directly at one of them <laughs> I didn't, I so I didn't think he kicked it. I thought he just scared it, but I guess it does look a little bit like kicking. It looks like it's flung bodily at Charles Gray. Yes, yeah. So it looks very weird, but anyway, yeah, the cat goes and Bond kills the one of them and then Blofeld goes, right idea, wrong cat, and then the actual, his actual cat with the diamond necklace comes into the room. And also scares the wrong cat away. It like hisses and swats at the other cat. <laughs> that poor cat is having a bad day. Bond notices that Blofeld also has that tape of Highland marches. Blofeld is like, all right, well, anyway, this has been fun, but enough of you. Go get in my elevator. And he forces Bond to get into the elevator at gunpoint. Yes. This is a fine example of should have just killed him. You should have just killed him. Yeah, I love... We haven't seen the floor of an elevator fall out from under a person no, yet. No, we haven't. But Bond's immediate reaction upon getting into the elevator is to immediately slam his feet up against the edges of the walls. Yeah. And like press himself into the corners, of, like corner of the elevator and like try and find a, a handhold for when the floor goes out from under him. And then he just gets gassed. I kind of love that because it's like we have seen trap doors from Blofeld, but we haven't seen the floor of an elevator go out. But I kind of like that. Yeah. So he gets rendered unconscious conscious by gas sent to the basement not killed no not killed rendered unconscious and sent to the basement by elevator where mr wint and mr kid pick him up and throw him into the trunk of a car also in the trunk of a car is one of their i believe it's mr kid's cologne the bottle for which bond lands on and breaks and ends up smelling the cologne. It becomes relevant way, way later. Then there's a very brief episode of Adam West's Batman as part of a hillside with a cactus on it, like raises up and a car exits. <laughs> 
Like it looks like the entrance to the Bat Cave from the 1960s Batman. It does. Adam West, by the way, was also pursued to play James Bond. Sure was, and turned it down because he didn't think that an American should play Bond. Yeah, and I think he would have been kind of great at it, to be honest. Yeah. Bear in mind, this is me. For years, I was convinced that my favorite James Bond in a vacuum was Roger Moore. And I, I still very much like Roger Moore, but he's the the way he carries himself as Bond, you know, very lighthearted Bond. I do enjoy that as its own thing. I like I like all the James Bonds, but I I very <laughs> much enjoy the way Roger Moore plays it. And I feel like Adam West would have been similar. <laughs> I, I get the same sense. I cannot imagine Adam West, James Bond. <laughs> being like serious hard-boiled no james bond no i would like to see the alternate universe where that happened i just assume it would be like the way that he played bruce wayne <laughs> right yeah but not quite as stupid because he did play bruce wayne a little thick it's true anyway so mr wind and mr kid drive bond into the desert and also do not kill him inexplicably they're assassins yeah but instead they put him into a length of pipeline on a construction site and then drive away giggling to themselves yeah so i put a note i actually wrote a note about this uh -huh. where I, I just said burying bond in a pipe is deeply impractical <laughs> with deeply all capitalized oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this pipe it's like a it's like a 12 foot long length of pipe it's probably two and a half feet diameter yeah and it's open at both ends and they just put Bond in it near the opening. Like they didn't even shove him down to the middle of the pipe. Yep. He's just sort of like in it. Yep. It's on an active construction site. Yep. I have a second note here. <laughs> I love that this pipe goes into service like 20 minutes after it's installed because <laughs> they leave him there at night. And then the next morning we cut to a shot of the construction site active. Mm -hmm. And there's like a crane lowering a piece of pipe into the ground. And then we cut back to the pipe that Bond is in and we can see him slumped in the bottom of the pipe. A worker like connects two crane hooks to the top of the pipe, evidently not looking inside it to make sure it's clear. The pipe gets lifted up, dropped into place, and then they like cover it over and Bond wakes up in the pipe a few minutes later, now buried with like nowhere to go, right? Like he's now closed in this pipeline on both ends. How long could he possibly be, have been unconscious for? I guess that gas just kept him out for like a really long time because there's a <laughs> montage. It's like with dissolves of them filling in holes and laying in pipeline. And by the time he wakes up, he can't see the end of the pipeline. Yeah. It, infrastructure projects where I come from take years to complete. But apparently in Las Vegas, they're just incredibly efficient. Yeah, it's absolutely unreal. The fact that at no point anybody notices this entire human man lying in the section of pipe is ridiculous <laughs> but anyway yes he he wakes up there's a rat and a he says one of us smells like a, a tart's handkerchief and then he sniffs himself and it's like oh sorry about that it's me because of course he's soaked in cologne then the rat sort of like turns and runs because there's a machine coming down the pipe my assumption is that this is a welding machine. This is the logical leap I took when I was watching this movie because it's not at all clear what this machine's purpose is. So this is a real machine. Oh, okay. It's called a pig. Apocryphally, that stands for pipeline inspection gadget or pipeline inspection gauge. In truth, there is no actual, it's not an acronym. It's just a pig. They're called pigs and they go down pipelines. There's various theories for why that name came up. For a period of time, Kathleen worked in oil and gas, as did her dad. And these are just, they're called pigs. They're put in pipelines and sent down to, I mean, there's various uses for pigs. Some of them are to, you know, inspect the contents of the pipeline or the integrity of the pipeline or whatever. I also have always assumed that this one was welding them, even though that actual, that's not what pigs are for and wouldn't be possible at the speed that it's moving. Right. And they would have had to weld it when they were attaching it, which makes it even more unlikely that someone wouldn't have found his body. But there are machines like this that they just send down pipelines to 
to inspect them. Okay, yeah, I was sort of going back and forth between like, all right, we know that this is a high tech place that uses robots. And so they are just laying the pipe and then they send this machine that is doing the like electrical swipey things with its little appendages on all of the pipes. And I'm like, okay, and it's like throwing electrical light and sparks, right? So I'm like, maybe they're just using this robot to weld the pipe shut. They did lay it very quickly. But it being just a like a maintenance machine to check that the pipe is all there makes sense, too. Anyhow, it comes at Bond, Bond hops on top of it, rides it for a little while, then grabs two of the appendages and mashes them together, shorting the machine out. And then we cut to a couple of maintenance workers, beleaguered maintenance workers being like, oh, man, why is it every time one of these stupid machines breaks down? It's got to be in between two pipes. From my understanding in talking to people who work in oil and gas in British Columbia, that's the most believable part in this whole film. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it going to be 500 meters from the nearest hatch? They open the hatch and and Bond pops out of the hatch. It's like, hello. He comes out of the hatch dressed in a full tuxedo (laughs) and says, I'm sorry. Have either of you seen my rat? I was just taking him out for a walk. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) That's the kind of James Bond I'm here for. Yeah. Back at Willard White's penthouse, Blofeld gets a phone call from Saxby, or so he thinks, as we cut to Saxby's office and see that Bond is there on the phone with Q running their own voice box to make Bond sound like Saxby. There's a little quip where Blofeld's like deactivates the Willard White voice and then is like, are you okay? You sound like you have a cold. Bond and Lighter look over at Q and Q just like pokes a circuit board. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he like I don't know he like twiddles a resistor and then suddenly the voice sounds better it's anyway so he's like I don't think that Bond guy is dead uh, you know we should we should move Willard White and Blofeld's like no he's fine where he is at his home just outside Vegas really strange to volunteer that information okay not only is it strange to volunteer that it is also strange that it's Willard White's house outside Vegas that they have kidnapped Willard White and put Willard White in why did nobody change Check Willard White's house. That's an excellent question, and I'm glad you asked. I have no satisfactory response. <laughs> <laughs> they all rock up to White's house, strapped with guns, and Bond's like, "Hold up, just give me five. Mi- I don't understand why. By the way, he says, "Wait, give me five minutes." before you come in there guns blazing. He actually asked for 10 minutes. It's like five minutes to climb up there and then five minutes to find him. Yeah, and there's no reason for it. Just go up there with... Anyway, so Bond heads up to the house. This house, by the way, looks amazing. Is incredible. This is not a set, even though it looks like Ken Adam designed it. On the DVD special features, Ken Adam actually talks about this house as like, this looks like something I would have designed. So it's it's amazing. (laughs) Inside, Bond meets Bambi and Thumper, who are a pair of women gymnasts who who fight him. They beat the hell out of him. They basically serve him his ass. And it, like it starts out very acrobatic, but yeah, no, they basically just like beat the hell out of him. He manages to subdue them by tossing them into the pool and nearly drowning them. Well, they throw they throw him into the pool, which would be their mistake, as we all know. Oh, that's right. The pool is James Bond's natural habitat. I don't know. It's very <laughs> unclear. They throw him in the pool. They jump in after him and they start drowning him. And then he just reaches his hands up and goes, actually, I am drowning both of you now. He he is doing this like he's in the process of of like drowning them as Felix walks up mm-hmm. and he's like, so have you figured out where white is? He's like, I'm working on it. And then he lets them up to breathe and they they sputter and cough. He's like, nope, haven't found out yet and shoves them back under the pool. Eventually, Thumper breaks away from him and points down below the pool to like a safety bunker, I guess, underneath the pool house area of this amazing estate they go on in and there they find willard white who's basically like well what the hell took you so long is you know basically his sort of read on the situation (laughs) actually i think the first thing he says is what the hell happened to me yeah meaning like what has happened to my name and company he takes a look at bond who of course is still soaking wet and is like i see you met my friends bambi and thumper Mm -hmm. 
Willard White is played by Jimmy Dean, who was a country music singer, a TV show host, and S- Sausage King. <laughs> Are you familiar with Jimmy Dean sausages? I am now that you've mentioned it. I don't think they made it to Canada, but uh, Jimmy Dean sausages is a or was anyway a big brand of sausages in the mid-century it eventually would be purchased by sarah lee and then looped into um, tyson foods but yeah he had a big old big old brand of sausages anyway they they wanted someone you know like him to play the sort of howard hughes character which made him a little uncomfortable because at the time of this movie he was a tenured act at a howard hughes hotel (laughs) in las vegas (laughs) And, yeah. and was like, geez, I hope the boss likes this. Because <laughs> otherwise I'm canned. Well, he did a good job. Yeah. I th- I think he's he's another one of the, like, the really notable characters in this movie. He's great. I mean, right after this, they step outside and he sort of takes a deep breath, his first breath of freedom. And then they get shot at and they all like dive down. It's Saxby is further down the hill trying to take pot shots at them with a rifle. Bond mentions that it's saxby and and willard white is like bert saxby yeah tell him he's fired (laughs) after he's already dead yeah (laughs) yeah so a bunch of things happen sort of in rapid succession here Mm -hmm. blofeld abducts tiffany there's a brief scene at the casino with q using like a radio transmitter to cheat at the slot machines he's not taking the money but he's just making them all pull up jackpot every single time and tiffany case wanders up to him because they've met apparently and she's like hey has bond said anything about getting me a pardon Huh? And then she sees someone pass through the casino room with a cat, Blofeld's white cat. I don't know how it is that she's supposed to know that it's Blofeld's, but she thinks it's notable enough to pursue. And then while she's trying to figure out where they went outside, gets bundled into the car with the woman that was carrying the cat, which is actually Blofeld in drag, Mm -hmm. because that was his disguise to get out of the building without being seen it worked he got out of the building without being seen well he got seen by one person i don't know why she was able to i I don't know it's a very strange thing so then bond is leading willard white down to his facility to where the satellite was and it's gone willard white is super upset like all, all his staff are like oh my god the boss is here and he's like what the hell is all of this? Like, he's super mad about everything. (laughs) Yeah. You know, they they phone a different department and he's like, oh my God, it's the boss. Everything done to your spec, sir. The satellite's gone up. It's in space. It's all successful. Just like you said. I said what? Like, he's, (laughs) he's just so completely confused and angry about everything even though all of his staff are like oh we're doing it just like you wanted us to (laughs) and so yeah the the punchline essentially is that that satellite that's up in space covered in diamonds is using the amazing refractory power of diamonds to turn the power of the sun into an orbital laser (laughs) yep Sure is. Uh. And so Blofeld stages a test or a demonstration, Mm -hmm. I guess, and proceeds to destroy a nuclear missile bunker in the U.S. This would be near the Nevada testing site, which we talked about. The actual, like, reasoning for what he's doing is that he is going to auction control of the satellite off so that any country can destroy the nuclear weapons of the other countries and leave one nation with total nuclear supremacy of the world yeah that's that's his stated reason everything he blows up are nuclear missiles so he blows up a nuke silo in the u.s yeah he blows up a soviet submarine and then yeah he does a bunch of missiles in china with a man running around on fire it's not a terribly convincing being on fire no no while this is going on they roll on back like bond and white roll on back to willard white's penthouse and they're like, all right, well, we know what the plan is, but we d- we need to find some information that tells us, like, where they're doing it. Willard White's like, well, my empire is expansive. They could be at any one of my installations. And Bond is like, well, can you not think of anything? And he's like, they could be anywhere from Nevada to wherever the other places are. But he, he ends up being like, or or over here in Baja, Willard is like, Baja? Baja? <laughs> I haven't got anything in Baja. I love his delivery. Yeah. This stuff's made in New York City. 
<laughs> bah! So they identify that the likely place is this heretofore unknown installation on an oil platform off the coast of Baja, California. And now we head into our final action set piece of the day as they basically are getting ready to do their thing. Like they're all they're all on or the like Blofeld and Co. are all set up on their oil rig preparing to initiate the auction of this thing. I do appreciate the cut from the model of the oil platform to the actual oil platform. That's a good one. As the as the scene transition. Yeah. By the way, do you know how expensive it was for them to rent a disused oil platform? Probably quite expensive. $40,000 a day. Whew. Yeah, I mean, I'm given to understand that they had some problems filming on this oil platform, too. Well, I think the biggest was that once the big attack starts, because we'll get to it, but Bond does some stuff and then there's a big sort of military attack. They were running through everything and Guy Hamilton, the director, was like, OK, let's do one more dry run without setting off the explosions so that we know how everything's going to go. And the assistant director went, gotcha, one more run with all the explosions, understood. And they only had so many explosives and so much time and expense and everything. And so all the explosives went off and the cameras weren't rolling, except some of the helicopters were in the air and their helicopter-based cinematographer saw the explosions start to go and was like, oh shit, we're going, roll and filmed the entire take from a helicopter with all the explosions going off. And so long shots of the explosions you see from the helicopter are from that whoopsie take <laughs> where they got all the footage of the of the explosions that weren't supposed to happen. Right. So rewinding. Yeah. A plane is coming over the horizon They're like we got a bogey on the radar and a pod drops out of the plane and parachutes a little like triplicate of parachutes open up as it descends to the water and when it lands in the water it's sort of like a geodesic sphere mm -hmm. somehow cuts itself free of the parachutes and starts rolling towards the oil platform and it sort of butts up against the dock on the oil platform and unzips and outstips James Bond. What's his plan here? He has now realized that the the control mechanism for the satellite is the tape of Scottish marches. Mm -hmm. And so his goal, he has brought a fake tape sewn into the shoulder of his suit. Essentially, he plans to get captured and then break out and try to replace the tape and so he comes ashore and blofeld is like ah hello mr bond what are you up to and then just tells his subordinates search him from his toes to the last hair on his head and then bring him to me and so they do and they find the tape and so when we see him he's now standing in blofeld's office with the shoulder of his suit torn open awaiting blofeld's judgment as he's being taken away for this search he sees that tiffany case is out sunbathing on the the oil platform yeah she's just sort of chill with it she's like i'm i work for blofeld now whatever so blofeld is like well you you were right you correctly deduced that the tape was the control mechanism in fact the tape that he brought was the actual scottish marches <laughs> tape yeah because he played like blofeld plays it back and he's like i never could stand martial music and then he apologizes for ruining the line of your suit but he's like you won't have a chance to do this we've caught you now your plan was half-baked you know you're not gonna be able to do this but he takes him on a tour of the installation and shows him the whole operation why seems like a blofeld thing to do He's being very chummy, very, you know, very accommodating. And he takes him around It shows him the control room. And Bond is like, oh, OK, so that's how it works. And walks over to the like the big control panel for the satellite and is like, I bet you just press this button and the cassette just pops right out. Right. Presses the button and the cassette pops right out. I actually need to scroll back a little bit. Just as he is being taken on this tour by Blofeld, Tiffany walks into the office. As they proceed to the door, they all turn away from the desk and Blofeld goes first. And Tiffany follows behind them, grabs the tape and passes it off to Bond behind his back. Manages to sort of draw Blofeld's attention and it's just like, hey, can I come on the tour too? And he's like, no, no, stay here. So Bond has the replacement 
tape on his person, unbeknownst to Blofeld at this time. He pops the tape out, which, of course, everybody in the room then turns to scowl at him, Blofeld included. Bond is just like, oh, oops. Blofeld essentially says you've outlived your entertainment value. Yeah. I don't remember the exact line, but he's he's like, you you have outlived your entertainment value. Put the tape back. And so Bond palms the real tape and swaps the fake one in and puts it back in the machine. And they like he's like, all right, now we're going to take you to the like to the brig. And he instructs his underling to search him again just for good measure. Bond then needs to palm the tape off. So he manages to like catch up with Tiffany Case standing next to her, just slides the tape into her bikini bottom and then is taken away. Tiffany at this point doesn't know that the swap has already happened. Bond gets locked up in a, like a, a maintenance cupboard. It has a hatch in it why would you put him in the prison cell with a hatch in it (laughs) (laughs) so he opens the hatch in the floor which leads out underneath the oil rig and i guess their thinking is that oh well it's too far down he'll fall to the well he won't be able to get anywhere but of course bond lowers himself out of the hatch onto like a rope that's hanging across the bottom and manages to sort of like shimmy along the bottom of the the oil rig while at the same time tiffany is back (laughs) swapping the tape again then the assault begins because he had let a weather balloon go oh that's right on the way to the brig he had let a weather balloon go felix Leiter and willard white are in a helicopter going like oh that must be his signal and then the camera pulls back and it's them and a whole bunch of i assume navy helicopters right i want to give shout outs to the countdown guy things start going absolutely ham there's explosions there's gunfire and this one dude with just the perfect voice just sits at his table the whole time and does the like eight minutes and counting seven minutes and counting (laughs) he's great yeah but yeah like the flaps on these towers fall down revealing gun emplacements you know like blofeld's got this place armed to the teeth and a whole bunch of helicopters rock up with like rockets and guns and there's scuba men who swim aboard and you know it's a whole thing so there are not scuba men who swim aboard well there are in a deleted scene I'm sorry. Yeah. I got to stop watching the deleted <laughs> scenes because I'm like, I keep conflating them with things that actually happened in the movie. There were, yeah, there were meant to be, but they got deleted, but they did make it on the poster for the movie. Yes, which has confused some people. <laughs> yeah. My favorite thing about this, scene, like this is a pretty good, it's a pretty good action scene. There's like helicopters flying around and things are exploding and guns are shooting. My favorite part of it is like, it's solidly two thirds of the way through the scene before we actually see a barrel flash on any of the gun emplacements. So if you watch closely in the wides, the guys manning the guns are like swinging the guns back and forth. And there are sound effects of going them going, but the guns aren't doing anything. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) So anyhow, while all this is going on, this is when Tiffany uses this as a distraction to go and switch the tapes. And then she catches up with Bond and is like, I did it. I swapped the tape. And he's like, you idiot. You just put the real the real one back in. Chronologically, that actually happens before he gets taken to the brig. Oh. And then she goes back to try and fix it again. And Blofeld sees the outline of the tape in her bikini bottoms and gets her locked up. Right. But he doesn't discover her until after she's already swapped the tape. Actually, I think he stops her, but it becomes irrelevant because what ends up happening is as the satellite gets closer and closer to being in orbit above its target, which is Washington, D.C. Blofeld's like, well, we're getting super attacked here, so I'm going to make my escape. And just sort of wanders freely across the deck of this (laughs) platform (laughs) into his tiny science fiction escape spaceship and barks at the crane operator to pick him up and lower him into the ocean. Terrible escape plan, just because it takes so long and relies on another human to do it. Another human, which Bond knocks out and takes over control of the crane with Blofeld screaming at who he thinks is his operator to to be more careful. Bond tells Tiffany to pick up a gun and shoot at some guys. The guys get taken out by a helicopter before she can do anything. And she just starts firing the gun and the recoil like knocks her back off the crane and I think into the water. Yeah, she falls off the oil rig into the water. You were right. The movie is not kind to Tiffany Case. The movie is not, especially at the tail end, the movie is not kind to tiffany at all she makes a mistake she doesn't even get to redeem the mistake and it's like a mistake that she could not have known she was making she genuinely thought she was helping yeah 
And that's after just being a body that gets moved around the movie. Not a good character. Anyway, Bond picks up Blofeld's escape craft and swings it like a wrecking ball into the control room repeatedly until eventually it crashes all the way through, destroying all of the equipment, rendering the satellite immobile or what have you. And then Bond swan dives off the oil rig and we cut to a cruise ship. Yeah, that that is the end of the A plot. Willard White yells to to Bond, "If you're having fun out there, just tell the captain and he'll he'll drive it in circles for you." Yeah, and James is like shouting back and forth with Felix on the dock as well. He's like, "Well, we've told MI6 you're headed home. Didn't tell them what what way you were taking." Yeah. And the camera, this is a great shot, the camera filming up at the deck slowly pans down and we see staring out of adjoining portholes are Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. Because, of course, the interesting henchmen have to make a return. So Bond and Case are making out on the deck of their suite. I assume it's a very fancy suite. A couple waiters come in with their dinner. It's Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. They have an amazing spread, you know, like a... A, a drinks cart and a dinner cart. They have flambe skewers. And for dessert, bombe surprise, which is an enormous sort of meringue looking thing that we've just seen Mr. Kid put a bomb inside. Yeah. A bombe surprise. <laughs> you know that that's just because they enjoy their work. Oh, yeah. That's just a joke for them. So, all sorts of fun things happen in this scene as mr wint offers bond a glass of wine and he pours him a taste and and bond you know has a sip comments that it's sort of an unusual selection and that he would have expected expected a claret with the spread that they'd been given to which mr wint replies well unfortunately our cellar is poorly stocked with clarets to which bond replies actually this is a claret mr kid who's preparing the flambe proceeds to light the skewers on fire and start coming at them as if they are weapons because bond mentions the the whole reason he was suspicious to begin with is he mentions that it would be unusual for a sommelier to wear such a strong cologne and the last time he smelled that cologne he also smelled a rat because that's the cologne that was in the car when he got dumped in the pipeline so yes realizing they've been rumbled mr kid lights his flambe skewers on fire and starts menacingly coming towards them yes bond throws alcohol on him basically lighting him on fire he basically like hurls himself overboard on fire falls to his death in the ocean mr wint looks furious and pained and his eyes go wild with a variety of emotions Mm -hmm. he starts trying to strangle bond with his sommelier chain given all available options the one thing that tiffany case decides to pick up and hurl at mr wint (laughs) she chooses the fluffy looking dessert now it happens to be a bomb but she doesn't know that so instead of bottles of wine knives anything hard she throws the dessert and the bomb skitters across the deck yeah. This provides enough of a distraction for Bond to turn the tables on Mr. Wint. Who he gets behind, wraps his hands up with Wint's own tuxedo tails, sort of pulls his arms through, like, through his legs to the back, ties the bomb onto his tails, and then flip hurls him over the side of the boat, where upon impacting with the water, he explodes. Yeah. Which nobody seems to notice. And Bond makes a quip about running with his tails between his legs or something to that effect. Bond and Tiffany sort of recollect themselves. Tiffany looks up at the sky, turns to Bond and asks, how the hell are we going to get those diamonds back? Oh, right, because they see the satellite going overhead. Yeah, and it, it pans up to the satellite going overhead. And that's the end of the movie. Da, 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 da. So what do you think? I don't like this movie very much. <laughs> no, I, you, the listener at home, may have been able, if you're really good at listening to subtle vocal cues, you may have been able <laughs> to tune into the fact that Matt and I are <laughs> kind of low on this particular movie. Yeah, it's okay. It's not, it's not the worst Bond movie no it's not by a long shot it's just profoundly by the numbers and 
Willard White is fun and Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd are interesting, but neither of his female co-stars are given anything to work with. And Blofeld is like not menacing. <laughs> no, Blofeld is not good. That was why I was as surprised as, as I was. You thought Charles Gray was like a better villain. Oh, I just think it makes more sense for him to. I think he's a better villain than he was a friend. Yeah, but he's a not good Blofeld. No. I don't know. This movie's got a mean streak. I don't like it when Bond gets mean. Like, not Bond the character, but Bond movies get mean. And I think that, like, the treatment of Tiffany by this movie especially is just mean. The car chase is fun, but it doesn't really work for me. Most of the action is good. The assassination attempts are great. I think the, like, ridiculous, stupidly conceived assassination attempts are super, super enjoyable. Mm. Those sorts of things don't have to make sense. And like they almost work so locking bond in a casket and trying to cremate him Mm -hmm. it's super silly like that whole sequence is super silly and like played straight for no reason yeah that scene rules like that whole sequence rocks it's hilarious but the overall on this i would call just a middling bond movie i definitely agree I guess let's go through in our in our usual order, beginning with the pre-title. We have Bond questioning a series of informants and then discovering Blofeld's mud bath and killing Blofeld. Like, it's fine. The not seeing Bond's face until he does the Bond James Bond line is good. So I, I object on the grounds that they just did that. <laughs> They're repeating themselves. That's obviously what they're going for, though, when it's like, no, check it out. It's Connery again. Hooray. I mean, you know, what? what so whatever you think of that, the whole scene in the science cave is weird. <laughs> the science cave. I don't think this one's great. My answer to this one is this one I, I'm not crazy about. The bit in the science cave is just it's such a weird contrivance of a scene Mm -hmm. and murdering a Blofeld double in a mud bath and then murdering another Blofeld double in a mud bath. Like the whole scene is brown. It is. The set is weird. Like the set is is clearly elaborate for the constraints of the budget, at least, but it's not visually pleasing. Mm hmm. I would put this one for me above OHMSS frenetic beach fight, but below Thunderball's fist fight rocket pack. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. I'm sort of waffling on whether whether it goes above Thunderball or not, but I think it goes below. I think that's a much better Connery fight than this weird mousetrap scalpel battle with the Spectre goons. By the way, Spectre, I mentioned that it's not mentioned in the movie. Spectre and Blofeld would become legally mired in with all of the Kevin McClory Thunderball malarkey and wouldn't be mentioned by name again until the movie Spectre from 2015. Mm Mm-hmm. There would be a pretty obvious reference to Blofeld made in the middle of the Moore run, which we'll talk about, but Blofeld is never mentioned again by name until 2015, once all the rights around Spectre and the character of Blofeld were back under the same roof. So this is the last we're going to hear of that organization or this character for decades. Did I mention that in all of... I don't think I did. Among their many things that they were trying to do to recapture the glory of Goldfinger, the original treatment for this movie was going to be James Bond battling against Gert Frobe as Goldfinger's twin brother. You didn't mention that, but I knew that. That's something I definitely want to mention for the benefit of our listeners, because that is a... I mean, that's when you know you're really reaching. (laughs) When it's like, oh, God, we'll get we'll get everyone back. We'll just make another Goldfinger. Once again, I want to enter the the alternate universe where that happened just out of curiosity. Yeah, same. All right. The title. It's a good song. Diamonds Are Forever is a good song. It's Shirley Bassey. She's belting it out. It doesn't approach the heights of Goldfinger. I love OHMSS too much. I really like this. I think I still prefer Tom Jones Thunderball better. So I'm going to put this just below Thunderball. I think I'm going to put it above Thunderball. That's fair. I can sing this song basically from memory, and I can't with Thunderball. Hmm. That is the arbitrary metric by which I am judging this today, is that I can pretty much sing this song from memory. Weird flex, but okay. <laughs> yes, I 100%. You're not wrong. No, that is an 
utterly acceptable arbitrary metric upon which to gauge this these are <laughs> these are our james bond movie opinions if anyone has a problem with what we think of them that's fine they can disagree they can fight me irl please don't fight me irl no just go make your own podcast it'd probably be easier no no <laughs> truthfully it'd probably be easier to fight me irl <laughs> so i suspect based on our current power rankings of overall movie is that this is going to come down to whether we think Diamonds Are Forever is better than Thunderball or not. Is that accurate Nailed for it. you? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Gosh, we weren't kind to Thunderball. No. But I think it's better than this. Yeah. I don't know. I have a hard time. I have a hard time too, but like at least Domino had an interesting character and stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. And Tiffany Case doesn't and that's nothing on jill st john who did well with what she was given but like yeah plenty of tool shows up gets thrown out a window and killed off camera that's rough but tiffany case doesn't have anything relevant to do to the plot she's just along for the ride yeah i think thunderball as a movie works better Mm -hmm. right like it, it has a better through line it makes more sense it doesn't make a lot of sense but it makes more sense thunderball's like greatest crime is that it's boring mm. that is not the case with this movie this movie is not boring no that's true it's it's very silly this movie's quite silly the moon landing the vegas car chase everything with willard white bond riding the elevator up and piton rappelling around the top of the casino you can't say it's boring no its final act takes place above the water <laughs> indeed and at full speed mm -hmm. i think if anything the the biggest crime of this movie is that it it's tacky right like it's it's not just silliness silliness is fine for bond movies in places the language i would use to describe this movie is mean and cheap and tacky. That's Vegas, baby. I know. No, I I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to put it below Thunderball. So am I. All right. It sounded like you weren't necessarily going to. I waited until the last possible second to make that decision. <laughs> I was arguing with myself there. Fair enough. And so closes an era of James Bond. Sean Connery would not return to an Eon Productions James Bond movie. We'll see him again. And I still am pretty sure that I've never seen that movie. So I'm <laughs> I'm trepidatiously looking forward to it because the comments we've seen on the YouTube videos so far are kind of divided on whether Never Seen Ever Again is a absolutely better or definitely worse <laughs> take on the thunderball source material <laughs> so i'm fascinated for what it's worth i have seen it multiple times and i can only remember one scene in the whole film oh awesome but i've definitely seen it two or three times all right but next time we move fully into the 1970s with a brand new bond and a brand new tone for the movies mm -hmm. that would carry through the next seven films as Roger Moore steps in to the gun barrel as James Bond. And I am really looking forward to discussing next episode. Yeah, me too. Which will be Live and Let Die. So until... Oh, that's really going to mess with the main title song power rankings for me, at least. Anyway, <laughs> more on that next episode. Until then... Matt, thanks always. This is a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Shout outs to Matt Griffiths for doing the excellent video editing work if you're watching the video version. Thanks to Heather for doing podcast admin. And thanks all of you for joining us here and listening and for supporting us at patreon.com slash loading ready run because it helps us do everything that we do. And we really appreciate it. So until next time, this podcast will return. Mm -hmm.